The scene of one of the worst genocides of our time to relative normality in just over 20 years. Rwanda's renewal, is it all that it appears? This is Roundtable with me, David Foster. Just over two decades ago, the Central African country Rwanda was crippled by genocide, reeling after the slaughter of up to a million people. The infrastructure, the economy completely shattered. Well, with order and stability now, this country is hailed as a model of transformation. Under the surface, though, there is discontent beginning to bubble. It's been called a development miracle and hailed as a success story in Africa. For a nation that witnessed the horrors of genocide, Rwanda has been transformed in just two decades, attracting foreign investment, open trade, with low levels of corruption. I think if you'd said to anybody after the genocide that R Rwanda would be as peaceful and stable and, and prosperous as it is today, people would have laughed at you back then. And it was largely down to this man, President Paul Kagame, and his party, the Rwandan Patriotic Front. We are doing our best to grow our economy, to build on different kinds of investments, to make sure that we are standing on a solid ground. But as he takes power for an unprecedented third term, he now stands accused of heading a repressive regime, committing human rights abuses and silencing his political opponents. At what cost has stability come to Rwanda? But underneath the sheen, there's growing discontent. Kagame! Kagame! Kagame's regime has been accused of extrajudicial killings, smear campaigns and the silencing of political dissent. The authorities are, are trying to spread this, this climate of fear and make people scared to, to resist, to speak out, to have to oppose government policies. Kagame returned to office with 99% of the vote in recent elections. That's after he changed the constitution to allow him to run for a third term. His critics point to a series of cabinet reshuffles that have allowed him to deflect leadership challenges, all evidence, they say, of his tightening grip on power. 20 years on and the memory of genocide is still raw. Given its violent past, those who support Kagame say Rwanda can't afford to slide back into violence. But as the country moves forward, the political pressure is rising. I think things have begun to gradually change in Rwanda. And I think what we're seeing from the grassroots level all the way up to the national level is an increasing desire for a more open political space. For now, that space is being tightly controlled. With his huge popular mandate, Kagame could be in power till 2034. For his supporters, a sign he's central to the stability of Rwanda. For his critics, another strongman on a continent troubled by authoritarian rulers. With me at the round table today, Andrew Wallace, author of Silent Accomplice, the untold story of the role of France in the Rwandan genocide. He's optimistic about the future of the country. Next to him, Eric Eugène Marangwa, founder of Football for Hope, Peace and Unity and Survivors Tribune, who thinks Kagame has done a lot for Rwandans. To my left, René Mugenzi, chairman of the Global Campaign for the Rwandan Human Rights. He feels that his countrymen are living in fear of the regime. And then Jonathan Rosenthal, Africa editor for The Economist, who says that Rwanda trades human rights for development and that is harmful. Thank you very much for coming in for this programme. A couple of points I want to throw out before we actually start. One is that I don't think it can be denied that Kagame's clamped down on some corruption and crime, 
Per capita income has gone up double between 2000 and 2008. Life expectancy up. Half of all children are now going through primary school. Put that beside what Human Rights Watch has just been saying with the recent election, people have been arrested, forcibly disappeared or killed. Independent media muzzled and intimidation has silenced groups working on civil rights. They don't sit comfortably together, those two pictures of Rwanda. So let me ask you, Jonathan, first of all, how many Paul Kagamis do you think there are? Paul Kagame is an, is an absolutely extraordinary figure. If you, if you look at his entire career, starting with his military career, when he was in the bush with a handful of people, helped overthrow a dictatorship in Uganda, went on to then uh, you know, win a civil war, end a genocide in Rwanda, and then later as a, as a, as a you know, president and commanding general, uh, invade a very much bigger country uh, next door. It, you know, as a military commander, he's been extraordinary, and as a president, uh, in terms of some of the development indicators you mention, in terms of economic growth, he has been absolutely extraordinary. But that is just the one side of him, and the other side is this authoritarian who brooks no dissent. It, it, that's the picture that you see, obviously, Rene, the person who brooks no dissent and is determined to take his campaign to keep that dissent bottled up. Um, overseas, even you, you had your life threatened. Uh, yes, yes, he's one of the uh, Kagame is one of the most uh, dictator, dictator dictator in Africa, who's very worse than most of the dictator we had we had had in Africa. Um, no, he 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 been suppressing most of the uh, people who are you know who are op opposition in Rwanda and outside inside of Rwanda. For example, exa example you just mentioned even here in the UK, he he had tried to to he sent his um, his. These people to try to assassinate me because of I've had. And you were warned about this by MI5. You had police protection. Yes, the plot have been have been they have been discovered by the MI MI5, and then I had to go to to special protection. It's not that was the lucky one because in the other countries there have been assassination by the Rwandan intelligence intelligence people have been assassinated in Belgium, in Kenya, in 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 uh, South Africa. Um, in Cameroon, so I was the, the lucky one. So it's not only in outside of Rwanda, also inside Rwanda, the the people have been opposition opposition figure have been put in prison, assassin, and as well as uh, mm. journalists assassinated, assassinated. So, so, so Kagame is at the same time a dictator. Also, I disputed the figure which which you, you mentioned about the economic growth. It have been, it have been uh, found recently that most of the figures have been presenting, they, are, they, are not, they have been manipulated. That's a fact. One of Can the we go into that a little bit later on? Because I want okay. to talk about the economy then. But the picture as portrayed mm. by René, is, is that a picture of Rwanda that either of you, we'll start with you, Eric, recognise? Um, I'll, I'll just start by uh, what uh, uh, Jonathan said, um, where uh, President Kagame's career started from. It, it, it actually da, doesn't start from where most people think it started from, where, which is the leader of the uh, rebellion group that, that uh, liberated Rwanda and stopped the genocide in, uh, in 1994. Uh, it, for me and for many people who have followed um, the journey of President Kagame, it started from the day he was forced out of the Rwanda as a two years old boy. And from there on, the life he lived shaped his understanding. But, but can we look at what is happening now? Well, and let me just what, tell our viewers what that you, now, you were an international football player. Yes. You captained your country. You were a goalkeeper, and, and you're wearing your trademark hat <laughs> that you brought with us today. And your football yes. initiative, which we'll talk about later, right. is something you believe strongly in. Is, is the picture that we've just heard from? No, I, I, that's not the picture. That's a, uh, that I think that again, that's the problem with the uh, the. Pe those people who uh, uh, try to go against the, the government of Rwanda and the, and, and the president of Pokagam, they lack objectivity in their criticism. But if somebody's threatening your life, you, you're going to be pretty subjective about it, aren't you? Well, if it's true. But I doubt if that is true. You, 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 we can say that, uh, that there is a record from uh, Metropolitan Police, but it's not the first time the Metropolitan Police may have made the mistakes in, 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 in their judgment. It, this is the kind of things that happens. Uh, Reliable every now intelligence, and again. they said, poses an imminent threat to, to your life, uh, your life, Rene. Yeah, be, okay, if, so you're, um, you're doubting that story. If I can come in on that, Please. I mean, that intelligence came from the DGSE, which is the French intelligence service. Now, the DGSE worked very closely with the very closely with the former genocidal government, as we know, France was heavily implicated in arming and training the Habir Amana regime, and in after the genocide, helping to continue to arm and train them in the camps in Zaire. 
DGSE has a very long history of disinformation. Um, that uh, bit of information, MI5, they took it completely from DGSE. They have not looked at it. They've not explored it. They've just said, this is a tip-off from our counterparts in France. I think I've got to give Rene the chance to come back on that. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, uh, They're saying you're talking nonsense. I'm not saying it's talking nonsense. <laughs> what I'm okay. saying is, is the link there, you see, we've not explored it. We've just taken the headline as we do with Jonathan's. Uh, you know, we take a headline, <laughs> let's have a look behind the headline, let's see where it's all actually begun. Yes, I but the, the MI5 and the security service in the UK are very professional services. They cannot take information from an external intelligence officer, not to verify them themselves, where they come from. They would be verified very well, then they present them to the Rwandan government. Firstly, they deny officially. After, after they say it's not for them, just the, the, the chief of intelligence at the time, which they went, they went on three months later, they moved them, they moved him to show the Britain that it was just him, not from the, the, the president itself. So okay. he was moved three months later. I'm going to stop of just this at this point because we've got to talk about the country as, as a whole. Um, repression, aggression, uh, ending of dissent, is that a price that the people of Rwanda are being asked to pay? Uh, for uh, what is described in many cases as a model African country now. So, so I have to say, I've met the leaders of several other African countries and, and the leaders of the opposition in many African countries, and I say, what is a model that you want to follow? And very often they say Rwanda. And, and uh, th I mean, this is, this is the terribly confusing thing about Rwanda, though, because in many people's minds there is an absolute trade-off that you would never expect in the West. But there is a trade-off when people talk about Africa that says you need a strong authoritarian leader, otherwise you can't have good governance and no corruption. And, and I've got to disagree with that very strongly. That there is you know, good governance in Rwanda, that is fantastic, but it does not have to go hand in hand with you know, the assassination of, of you know, opposition members in the country and outside the country. It doesn't have to go hand in hand with, you know, as, as reputable human rights organizations have said, with you know, the, the, the abduction of street traders and, and detention and beating of street traders with a summary execution of petty criminals. Those, those two do not have to go hand in hand. Yeah, so we're looking at a man who's, who's asked people to change the constitution, they voted to change the constitution, it means he could stay in power for at least the next 17 years mm -hmm. should he wish to do so. If you don't have ulterior motives, if, if you want to bring your country on, you bring on other people, mm -hmm. don't you? You trust mm -hmm. a democracy. And that's, he's not doing so. But he did not ask to change the constitution. We, the Rwandan people, asked him actually to allow us to change the constitution so that he can stay, uh, he can stand again. So uh, that, the way you, 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 you presented that, that, that okay. fact, I think okay. it, it, it can is, be is that the way you see it? Well, I, mean, I, I think we, and we're looking at it here also, I'm afraid, but um, and we do with, you know, Jonathan's uh, articles he's written and, and a lot of the others. We, we have the big headlines, you know, devil or hero, you know, black and white. The truth is far more complex than a thousand word article with a big sensational headline. You know, you have to get in depth. Kagame has 1.7 million Twitter followers. He was voted the most popular guy in Africa. If you, as you, Jonathan said, you go to Tanzania, I was recently in Cameroon, you talk to guys there, they say, please, please give us Kagame, because we need to sort out this corruption, we need to sort out our development. And if you go to the hills, and I don't know if Jonathan did in his recent visit there, in Gikongoro, in Buyumba, in Changugu, and you talk to the farmers there, the peasant farm, what do they want? They want education for their kids, they want health care, they want uh, one cow, the one cow project per family. They want... They're not getting a lot of money though, are they? Because they, I think they account for 96% of the uh, workforce in Uganda and they're getting 3 4%. Did I say Uganda? Yeah. Sorry, Rwanda. Um, they get something like 3% of the national budget. Yeah, it's, it's trying to... I mean, it's coming up from a margin, and that's the only thing I'd emphasise is in 1994 was ground zero. No country has ever yeah. come from that point of, you know, 8 million, 1 million are dead, 2 million have fled, and what's left is traumatised. No national institutions left. Doesn't there come a time at which you have to let go? Yes, but no, you're not, expecting, not, if not, I may not, say, not, David, just... you're expecting, and the, and the commentators here are expecting a country 23 years on, a mere 23 years on, to become a fully-fledged liberal democracy uh, and like Britain, you know, like, uh, that, that is, that is impossible, and that, there is no anywhere in the, in, the, in the history of the world that has happened. I believe look at, that if you look at the conflict-affected countries, such as Somalia, such as Afghanistan, such as Iraq, such as uh, uh, Libya, 
there is no way that uh, Rwanda can I think the fit best in way, that well, if you look like Sierra Leone, Sierra Leone, the best way to stabilize the country which come, which have experienced those terrible events of genocide and war is to bring uh, is to bring democracy and to bring rule of law in that country. It depends if you on try, it, then, then if there's a really rule of law. Mm -hmm. And there's also you know, freedom of speech so that people they can come up with a different idea, different spirit to contribute. That was the best way to stabilize the country. So I agree that Kagame is very popular across the Africa because they have done way to market himself. He, he spent a lot of money for the PR company to promote himself like that. But if we look in fact, you look in fact, even produce for, from the Rwandan government, how can Rwanda be a model if if only 2.5% of the uh, economic active people that are employed, how can Rwanda be a model? If 6% according to World Bank, 60% of World Bank is under poverty, poverty line. Just look at those figures. You see, there is so this, we have this, to yeah, there is this case, um, Jonathan, we'll put it to you, this one, that, that this is a country that is doing well because it's, that it's trading on the, the conscience of the world is getting propped up by international aid. People have felt guilty about what's happening there and, and it, that it couldn't actually stand on its own two feet. So, so I'm going to disagree with you partly on that. Right? Yeah, it's not, I'm just there, saying, there is, I'm yes. putting it out there. It's not my point of view. Fair enough. I, I, it's true that Rwanda gets a lot of aid, uh, as do many other countries. You know, it, it came from a very bad place 20, 23 years ago. Um, the economy was absolutely devastated. Um, but if simply giving aid to countries was, was sort of a guarantee of good outcomes, then you know, we, we'd be in a much richer, happier world right now. The fact is that... You know, as much as Rwanda has received aid, it has used it very well, and we have to give it credit for that. Uh, I mean, yeah. you, could, you could add, I mean, uh, the Howard Buffett Foundation is giving half a billion, half a billion Warren? to Rwanda. Yeah, Warren Howard, Buffett. Howard G. Buffett oh. Foundation. Okay, they've gone around, he searched for several years, looking around countries in Africa and the region, where he was going to give this massive sum to, and it's for agriculture, and they decided in the end to give it to Rwanda. Why? because they did their homework and they said Rwanda has good governance and their, uh, their poverty alleviation programs are working. They've taken a million out of so poverty. So you believe that the money that's going into the country is being well spent, or is it Absolutely. Doing I mean, what happens in a lot of countries in Africa? Just No, I mean, let, let's look at Transparency International's figures. You know, it, they're now, they've gone from 150 down to 50 on the corruption scale. They have less corruption than Italy or Greece or Hungary and, and several European countries. So, uh, and compared with the region, I think they're the second best in Africa in terms of anti-corruption. That's Transparency International figures. So, I don't know what you think to that, Rene, but clearly corruption is a huge problem in Africa and, and Kagame is tackling it. Yeah, I agree corruption is a very big problem in Africa, but in Rwanda, as I just mentioned, the, the they, they, they are more corrupted, but they don't, they're very well in terms of to hiding that. How can you, there's one of the UK-based uh, Oxford company, you know, they, they just pull out of Rwanda, in, in, they were helping Rwanda to, to collect the data of poverty, because Rwanda was changing the, 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 the way they were collecting uh, the, the figures. They found out that that's, that, that method is, is misleading. Also look, also look at Rwanda investment. If you look at Rwanda investment data as well, the World Bank data in Rwanda, there's four times Rwandan data is four times more investment uh, data than what bank produce. Why? Because Rwanda deliberately misleading those figures mm -hmm. by adding all the, the loans within the loans, the loans money long time, also pledge funding within the investment. So w when you look at those figures, say, wow, this, this country is doing well. Look at those streets, also those green streets, which is very good, which I like. This is a beautiful house. So when you look at those figures, which have been manipulated, and look at those streets, and you go to other African country, uh, and you say, other, other African country, you say, wow, this is the best way, but look, Look under the, you know, under the knee what is really, really happening. I understand what you're this saying. This ended in 2015. I want, to, I want to talk about the future. Okay. Yeah? I mean, here we are, four men sitting around a table mm. talking about Rwanda, which is a country which has the highest number of female parliamentarians of any country yeah, well, in, in the world. Mm. Uh, what about the youth of mm. Rwanda? I think, uh, this I think, is something you're heavily involved in. I think in. that's the key, and that's the way most people don't realize mm. the, the, the uniqueness of Rwanda. And... Uh, and a, a very conscious uh, uh, decision that was made by the leadership because everything that takes place in Rwanda is driven by that uh, idea of, of, of uh, building a new... Well, t tell me about how you do it with young people in football. Well, 
football as we know and, and the sport in general, it's, it's, a, it's a such a powerful tool that, that, that uh, uh, captures young people's imagination. And uh, for us in, in, in Rwanda, after, after the genocide, one thing that we needed to do was to find a way of uh, bringing people together. And uh, starting with the youth was the, was the best way to do it. And uh, having um, um, come from, from a sport background as a former football player myself, and survived the genocide uh, thanks to uh, my, 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 my football status. Uh, I so much believed in the power of sport, and I, I saw that as a way of contributing to the process and, and it of, is still going on. of reconciliation. And, and you, you see, this keeps young people out of trouble. It, it keeps mm. them focused. Discipline. They, they are the future them. of the country. Yes. Do, you, do you see an emerging youth class, educated class that's going to take this country forward? Oh, yes. Yes. That's, that's, that's what, what is happening today. Because if you go to Rwanda, I, I visit Rwanda two, three times a year. And uh, I don't go just to Kigali like uh, many people tend to focus Rwanda as, uh, as yeah. uh, you know, a capital city center place. I travel across the country. I meet all these young people in different villages. And one thing that you notice among Rwanda, and especially the youth, is a change of mindset, believing in themselves, the, the freedom of expression that, that uh, we, we work is Rwanda not to have. If you, if you go to the youth clubs and, and hear the, the, the interaction and discussion that takes place among, among the young people, you wouldn't say that Rwanda has a problem of uh, freedom of expression. Okay, could I, could I, yes, I come up on two things? I mean, two points. I think the, the one is, I mean, Rwanda is, is sort of hailed as a model of reconciliation, and in many senses it's made great progress. But Part of that reconciliation is also based on a taboo, and the taboo is that, that one cannot talk about you know, aspects of the past. So, so officially in Rwanda, one cannot mention... But that's, you know, not, sort of true, Jonathan. Jonathan. that's I, not true, That's not true, but pa pa part, part of my work, I encourage young people mm. to speak out and actually to have those discussions of yeah. what our history is. So the, 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 the people in our sessions, people, young people, are not afraid to talk about the issues of Hutus and, and, and Tutsis. But it depends on how, it depends how, how you put, put that across. So what do you, what do you think, Ray, I, I agree, about, about the, the immediate no. future and the longer term? Uh, the, the, the long, yeah, I agree young people that are the future of Rwanda. Their education is very important. Their understanding of the past is very important. But at the same time, in Rwanda, they're not, they, 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 they're kind of, they, you've got these narratives of, of you know, what is happening, what is what's happened, which is go around this uh, dictatorship regime, what have been thought. But the young people have got the free mind, and they will, with the time, uh, with the future, I think they will, they will be, you know, Rwanda, Rwanda has got a very good f future because young people, they are not thinking uh, like the current mm -hmm. regime. Also, you know, I noticed that most of the young people who go outside to, to get education, and when they get open, they, they, re they read a different, t t t uh, different type of view, which is not existing in Rwanda. Uh, you know, like in the UK, at least 40% of young people come to study international students, you know, they, they, they end up staying because they want to go to Rwanda that, where they are. They are. But, but is, the, is the structure in place, if, if well, I may uh, ask you, Andrew, yeah. is the structure in place I mean, to take this country forward with the young people, business-wise, for example? Well, I think, I think it's getting them. We, we're all talking in very black and white, and, and you know, it is so much more complex. It is a developing country. This, this idea of model, I don't recognise. There's no such thing as a model country. You know, it is a developing country. It is getting there from a very... Uh, you, know, you look at the countries in the region where they are, you know, DRC, Burundi... Um, you know, all sorts of problems. I mean, the recent Tabo and Becky report said at the current rate, uh, DRC is going to take 144 years to reach Millennium Development Goals 4. Kenya is going to take 30 years. Uganda is going to take 20 years. Rwanda, nine years. But what's so, happened in the last 20 years? Would you, would you say extraordinary? Well, I, yeah, absolutely, because you would expect 1994, if you looked at Rwanda, you said failed state and you look at Somalia and you look at other countries in Africa and they've not recovered, Remain. they've stayed in that. So something quite incredible has happened. Now, that the big deal now is to keep that moving along and to see it from a Rwandan point of view rather than this sort of white... Well, OK, so let's just get one. the final words from a Rwandan point of view. What do you think is going to happen in the next 10 years? Well, I think it will be the same of... Uh, the, the same or same, same things. That so I'm, you're happy with the progress? I, definitely, I'm very happy with the progress. And uh, I, I personally believe 
that uh, despite what many people think that President Kagame is uh, this sort of a leader who doesn't want to, to uh, leave power, uh, he's a, a man of his own and uh, he will leave when no, no one expects him to and leave. And is he going to leave, do you think? Really? No, Kagame is not going to leave very soon and, uh, you know, because he has, has uh, he has some reason. I think the future of Rwanda, as any other dictatorship or totalitarian regime, unfortunately, it might not end up well. So that's the experience we had had. Every time when a population has been oppressed for a long time, in one way or another, it changed, and some and is changed. Uh, it changed violently, which is something I don't really wish for Rwanda to happen. But if you, you know, Rwanda has never had any in the past. Have never have Thank any ch f in um, peaceful change change of power. Thank you and so this, much. this was a, a, the last time was a, an, uh, ex uh, was an, uh, a chance to do that, but it didn't happen. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for joining us on this round table. Paul Kagame, sometimes divisive, undoubtedly influential. Whether he chooses to stay in power until 2034, we won't know for some time yet. But that's what we've been talking about. The future and the past of Rwanda. Thanks for watching. From me, David Foster, and the rest of the team. Bye-bye. See you next time.